Um, so just a little background on uh, today's event uh, before we get started and bring up our morning keynote. Uh, the Entrepreneurs Association is the biggest student club here on campus at Anderson. And uh, this event is actually the largest student-run event that we do here. So really excited to have you all with us. Uh, we think it's going to be a great event. Um, and entrepreneurship is a core of you know, the Anderson curriculum. It's a huge part of what we focus on here and what we're known for. You know, from you know, when I first applied, we had to actually record a spoken word essay question about you know, the meaning of entrepreneurship to us, too. You know, Faculty, you know, entrepreneurial faculty connecting with you know, real world exposure and giving you the tools to kind of succeed in new ventures. Um, so we've tried to mirror that, that program with, uh, with the conference today. Uh, you'll see some of our faculty moderating panels, kind of bringing the academic perspective. And then you'll see you know, top flight you know, thought leaders, uh, leaders in various entrepreneurial fields um, in our panels. And then you'll see uh, in the, the case studies, some of the tools that we, we feel are critical for success in today's environment. Uh, and aspiring entrepreneurs get the chance to pitch VCs in the, uh, the fast pitch competition. So uh, we're very excited for the event. Hope you guys have a good time. Our theme, as you noted, or as I uh, mentioned, is it's the journey. And our, uh, our morning keynote, uh, Mr. Paige Craig, has certainly had a, a very interesting entrepreneurial journey starting at West Point. Uh, then as a Marine in Iraq, launching a PR firm in Baghdad, uh, and then becoming a very active uh, adrenaline-fueled angel here uh, on the west side investing in tech. He's got about 40 portfolio investments to date. Um, so his, his discussion today is called From Baghdad to the Boardroom. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Paige Craig. Is this thing on? Sweet, I hear it. Cool, I'm gonna do a little wire cleanup here. Good deal, well thanks for coming out. Um, I'm actually not from LA, it's sort of become an adopted home for me, but uh, I've, I've loved the city. I've been here now since September of 08, and very kind of you guys to invite me out here to talk, and I hope what I say today is actually useful to some of you. Uh, I have a wide range of experience from uh, going into Iraq to starting companies to investing. But I have to say, of all the things I've done, um, entrepreneurship is, is definitely a passion of mine. And that's one thing I want to talk to, uh, talk to you about, is passion. I think uh, most of my life has been governed by doing what I love. And, and I think that's important because I, some of you are going to, some of you are graduating and you have this important decision to make, and that's going to be, do I go join a company, or do I go start a company, or I'm going to go overseas and build schools for people. Maybe some of you will join the military. Um, some of you have aspirations to go into government. And, and whatever you do, I'm not here to say, like, one path is better than the other. But what I do want to say is that following your passion is what's going to be important. So my journey... Um, when I was a kid, my dad asked me what I wanted to be, and crazy enough, I said I wanted to be Indiana Jones. And uh, later on, I wanted to be a pirate, uh, and still things I aspire to be. But <laughs> um, it would be a great, great, great thing. But uh, I sort of had this plan at some point. I was going to be an engineer, go to MIT. I thought about Norwich. I was going to go study sciences and materials and make, like, I'd done this NASA space camp thing. I was going to go make like, materials that would stop things from burning up. Um, and I was an artist. I grew up in an art family. We ran a family art business. We did framing and graphics for artists. And I got into sculpture and painting. And I loved art. And I was working with guys, getting to know guys like Wayne Tebow and Greg Condos and Bill Gatewood, who brought like, Asian art to California, the big fans. And so I had all these things I wanted to do in life. And, I, and my pl plans changed all the time. And... Uh, I never really stressed out about it. You know, so this journey thing, some of you are sitting here like you have this very deliberate path you think you have to take. It's go through college, join a company, I'm going to do five years. But I think entrepreneurship is a little bit different. You know, entrepreneurship is, uh, I wouldn't really stress about that path, having a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. You want to have goals. But if you're always doing what you love in life, I'm going to tell you right now, with, you know, I don't have a lot of experience. You know, I'm sitting up here, I'm 36, but 
in the experience I've had, I've always done what I felt in my heart and what I've enjoyed. And whether that's made me money or not made me money, I've been the happiest person in the world because I followed my heart. And this is the biggest challenge for all of you, is to sit down and find out what you actually want. Because we're sitting in a world where TV and advertising, you've heard this before, you get bombarded all the time by what you should like, what you should love, and what you'd want. But the reality is all of you are very different. So some of you are probably best suited to go start a nonprofit and help people out in Uganda. And some of you are probably great photographers, and some of you are going to be great CEOs. But what you're going to do is really up to you, not to the rest of the world to decide. So in my own case, I grew up in Sacramento, California. Uh, had a range of interests from sciences to art. Uh, I actually studied, uh, uh, I wanted to be a diplomat, so this is funny. So 13 years old, uh, started going to Sac State, and I had this idea that I would be a diplomat. Now, if you know me personally, me being a diplomat is probably the worst idea for this country. <laughs> but but I, I really had this idea that, you know, I was 13, it's like, you know, I saw China rise, and it's like the U.S. and China, was that, that's, that's back in the 80s, I was like, we really need to deal with this Chinese thing. Um, and not in a native way, but like, they're going to be a pure competitor, so I was going to be a Chinese diplomat, studied Mandarin Chinese up at Sac State, and very quickly learned, I paid attention, they brought in you know, State Department people, and I realized that's not my personality. Compromising, negotiating, doing that, not really my style. So I changed, completely abandoned that idea. Uh, ended up being recruited to West Point, went there, did three years, um, studied math and a dual, dual uh, major math and military science. Math is fine, kind of like it. I love quantifying things. Um, wasn't really a passion, but the military science part was. I really loved the, uh, the art and science. And it's not the idea of blowing shit up and, and hurting people. Is that uh, of all the things I looked at in the world that I could do, the one thing I really couldn't get my head around was, how do you actually fight a war? How do you wage war? How do you bring peace into place? And it's like it was the biggest thing that hit me that I just couldn't grasp. Now, I, I could imagine being a scientist. I could imagine being an artist. I felt like I totally had that under my control. But when they came and talked to me, warfare was something totally out of my mind, right? Like, you can read about it. You can watch it in the movies. But it's something that you can never really understand until you experience it. And so I sought a big challenge. And that's the second thing, is look for challenges in your life. So two things, passion and challenge. So I sought out this biggest challenge, which for me was a big challenge, was to basically leave behind this idea of being an academic or being a scientist or being an artist and jump into the world of, uh, of being a military leader. Um, so I did three years there. And I realized also that I am probably not a good general. Um, I'm not a good rule follower. Um, and I, I can make rules, but I'm not really good at following other people's rules. We just broke a few yesterday. We were running a contest. Uh, if you guys want, you can go to our homepage, betterworks.com. There's a contest. You get a Starbucks card uh, to give us data. But my marketing director came to me and said, hey, we're going to run this contest. Uh, there's some rules about putting a contest online. He's like, we have to, should we go, let's go talk to the lawyers, talk to Fenwick, make sure we're good. I'm like, no, screw that, just do it. Um, not, not a good thing for a general officer. And I know my personality type. I, I will break rules. And this is another reality as an entrepreneur, as someone that's going to do things, you will break rules. And you're going to have to have the, uh, I'm not sure what the word is here. Uh, you have to have the understand, don't, you know, don't do things that are immoral. Have the courage to do the right things. But have the knowledge to know when to break stupid rules. Um, Anything from when not to waste a couple thousand dollars on a lawyer, trying to figure out if your contest is legal, to uh, in Iraq, we had to arm ourselves, and I brought in tons of legal weapons. And the reality was I had to keep my people alive, and the reality on the ground was it was illegal to buy weapons from certain places, and you had to register them. And uh, rather than do that, I just went out to arms dealers and bought weapons to, to arm my people. And I had to do that, and I kept my folks alive. But you have to break rules as an entrepreneur. You break a ton of them. And uh, you have to know which one's not to break. And, and a very easy judgment for this is um, don't break. There's a moral code out there, so always treat people well. Uh, treat them the way you'd want to be treated. Don't break those rules. But when you see regulations, business rules, things like that, don't be afraid to break those, especially when, especially when you're a startup. When you're just getting going, I mean, look at most companies that have succeeded, right? How many rules did YouTube break? Probably a ton. 
No, don't, don't be Facebook and don't hire Bursa Marsteller to go attack Google. That's a dumb play. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid to break rules. And that is a difference. I've, uh, I've seen with folks sometimes that come out of the, the Ivy Leagues or any, any school, really, a lot of times you have this mindset that, like, there are rules you have to follow, regulations, but that's not the reality. The reality is if you're going to build a company, you're going to break a lot of rules. So it's back to this passion. Passion is very important. So how did I get from West Point to Iraq? That's a long story. But basically, I realized I did not want to be a general. I did not want to be in the big, big army. I didn't want to run a bureaucracy of men um, and women, depending on what unit you're with. Um, I had no interest in actually running a 10,000, 50,000 person unit, counting spoons, working out spreadsheets, uh, doing bullshit training exercises. Had no interest for me. So I left. And I gave, gave that up. So I gave up you know, what I was doing at Sac State, wiped away three years of studying Chinese, which is a crazy hard language. Uh, wiped out three years ago to West Point, which is insane school. Like, I really had this idea that when you go to school, like, everyone takes seven classes a semester, and you all wake up at 5 a.m. and go to bed at, like, midnight. And that's... We take seven classes a semester, we all play sports, and you have military activities. I didn't realize, you know, I start hiring interns, and like, some of you guys just take three classes a semester. <laughs> what, two? Two, okay. Um, so, incredibly hard, it, and a lot, most people don't want to quit West Point. Like, you put that time in there, you get a name, you get a reputation, you get this community, and so people thought I was nuts. I mean, my task officer was like, you're, you're insane to leave. But I called my dad uh, before I did it. I told him what I was thinking, and I just told him I didn't really feel it. I, I couldn't see myself being, a, uh, being an Army officer for 10, 20 years, whatever, whatever that meant after I left. Um, so I left, and I traveled around the country for six months. Literally just traveled, um, hiking, diving. Went to Slaughter Canyon, New Mexico. Went to the swamps, uh, Louisiana, climbing Yosemite. Wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, and... Uh, just started driving around. And I ended up in New York. And the funny thing is, the Village Voice uh, was reading the newspaper, and they had some ads. And uh, they had um, pick apples up in the Northeast and uh, be a cabana boy or join the Marine Corps. And I actually applied for all three. And <laughs> seriously, I, I wasn't seeking anything out. I was just living life. Um, and the Marine Corps was really good about calling people back or dumb enough to call them. So... Uh, they called me back very quickly, went down there, and I ended up enlisting in, in the Marine Corps. So, um, I don't know if you guys know what a SMA is, but a SMA is a uh, shoulder-launched rocket that you put on your shoulder and blow stuff up with. Um, I wanted to go be a SMA gunner, just blow shit up with a rocket. And uh, they ended up convincing me that, so I went infantry, and then they convinced me to go into intelligence and some interesting transition time there, but I ended up going into the intelligence community uh, in the Marine Corps and first went off to, um, and so a long way, I, I studied Arabic at West Point. And the funny thing about Marine Corps is they decide that they're going to send me to be a uh, North Korean specialist. Uh, whatever, I don't know, I guess three years of Arabic. I was thinking maybe Middle East would be a good fit, but they sent me off <laughs> to go be a North Korean specialist. Um, and I spent a year focused on uh, North Korea some China stuff, but at the time we were very focused on the fact that we were going to kick the shit out of uh, North Korea at some point, which never happened. Um, did that for a while. Uh, internet starting to erupt. This is, you know, 95, 96. I did some fun stuff. I convinced the, the Marine Corps at the time. We were one of the first services to use the internet to start, exploiting, uh, start getting information from um, student chat rooms and doing very interesting things online. Had a great time there. Uh, and then kind of spent a few years in the Marine Corps, and then I got recruited um, and moved to Northern Virginia. And I joined the intelligence community in Northern Virginia doing uh, domestic counterterrorism, um, counterintelligence work, um, and a lot of fun things. And 2003, we're getting ready to go to war, and I wanted to go downrange. So long journey here, um, as you can tell, absolutely no planning. I really just kind of went with it. Uh, but finally, 2003, I kind of take a deliberate action. And they, they're not going to let me go downrange. And they basically say, look, and this is 2003, it's going to be like a year. You're like third in line. You're not going to be able to take 
this group downrange for like a year. And I'm like, the war is going to be over. It's going to be over in 04, right? How dumb is that? So uh, <laughs> I figured I got to rush into this place before it's done. So I'm running down 16th Street in DC, and I just realized like, this life is under my control. Like, I choose where I'm going to go. They're not going to let me go to Iraq. I'll just go there. This is part of being an entrepreneur, just do it. And, uh, and I realized I kind of got sucked into a bit of this government mentality of just like I was following this process, and I realized that's not really me. So I decided to break the rules again. Um, told my boss I was leaving, and uh, I was just going to go into Iraq by myself and uh, do it and just execute. And like, what's your plan? I'm like, you know, I got no plan. I don't know anybody in Baghdad. It's not like my buddies were chilling out there in the Sheraton Hotel. Um, no one. I had no idea. I, I read some stuff. I had access to some information, but uh, couldn't really use that stuff. So I literally um, had this idea that I would go to Iraq, and the capabilities that I thought our government was missing, I would create those. And I also had this assumption that private money would flow into Iraq. You know, year after it, private money would come in. They'd build hotels. They'd restructure Iraq, modernize the country, fix things, and I'd be there on the ground able to work both for the government and for the private sector. Uh, obviously, that private sector stuff took a little bit longer than we thought, but the military stuff really ramped up. And I went in there and essentially built a private human intelligence and private um, unconventional capability for the government and just went in. And, and this is where most people are curious about what I did. I'll try to share some of the things that I think are relevant to you as entrepreneurs. Um, over that period from 03 through 07, uh, I took that company from Iraq, drove in by myself there, uh, and then built a team on the ground. Went into Syria, Lebanon, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, West Africa, Horn of Africa, uh, Indonesia, and had the biggest adventure of my life. And I'll tell you, the best thing I ever did uh, was to make that decision to realize it was time to leave. And I think some of you will face this decision at some point. You're going to be sitting at you know, a BCG or Accenture. You're going to be sitting at some company. You're going to realize that you're no longer happy there, but that where you're at taught you something and it pointed you in a direction. Being in the government taught me a lot about what we were missing downrange. It made me realize that we had a real disconnect in the human intelligence side. It made me realize that we had a real gap between cultural understanding. Um, so it was valuable. Working in that big behemoth of the government was actually useful for me. And I realized it was time to leave. And so I think some of you may find that entrepreneurship comes to you later in life. It came to me later in life, even though I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So when you're out there working for that Fortune 500 company, wherever it is you go, you might, re might realize two, three, four years into it that you've learned enough, you've found your passion, and it's time to go. Don't be afraid to do it. It doesn't take a lot. It, uh, uh, it's really easy when you realize this is your life. I know it's a stupidly simple concept, but all of you set your agenda if you choose to. If not, the company or organization you work for sets your agenda. But if you're entrepreneurs, you set your own agenda. And that's a very key thing. So I set my agenda. I flew into Amman, Amman, Jordan. Went, uh, so my rough plan was, basically I had no plan, actually. <laughs> Didn't really have a plan. But I figured I'd go find some dude that'd be crazy enough to drive with me to Baghdad. So I went drinking around Amman, which is a normal course of business for me. Get a lot of stuff done at bars. And I'm at the Toro Bar. I can't remember what circle it is, but Toro Bar and find a taxi driver who is willing to take 200 bucks to drive me to Baghdad. So we do that. And along the way, he wants to know where I'm going. And I have no idea. Seriously, I had no place to stay in Baghdad. I had no place to go, no one to meet. I was just like, take me to Baghdad. So... We went, and along the way, I figured it out. Um, so I went in there with $10,000 in a camera bag. Right? 10000 bucks in a camera bag. You know, the military's coming in with, like, I don't know what it costs us in tax dollars, but they got a couple billion dollars, maybe a couple trillion. Um, and I go in there with 10000 bucks in a camera bag and think I'm going to change the world. And that is entrepreneurship right there. And all of you will have to do that. Maybe you'll do it with 100000 or 50000 Eventually, I brought another seventy grand in. So my, my grand investment in Iraq was uh, $80,000 to get my company started. And you will all have to do the same thing. You'll have to go into some place where it's chaotic and difficult and uh, build something out of essentially nothing. Because that seventy grand, that eighty grand, was nothing, right? I mean, you guys know how much an AK costs? I mean, it was pretty cheap in the early days. It got really expensive once Blackwater and other people started buying it. But weapons are expensive. 
Um, living's expensive. Paying people's expensive. So 80 grand was not much money. So I had to figure out very quickly, how in the hell are we going to make money in a war zone? There's a lot of ways you can make money in a war zone. Uh, some of them you probably don't want to engage in. And I did not want to build a business the way some folks did. Uh, I, I did want to solve a real problem. So uh, I went to the military. I went to the State Department. I went to everyone that would listen to me and just ask them what their problems were, what they were facing. And this is a key part of entrepreneurship as well, uh, which no one taught me this, but just talking to the folks I want to serve and learning from them, I found out what they were missing. Um, second thing, though, that I realized is your customers sometimes don't have a clue what they're missing. So it's a dual-edged sword there. You can talk to folks, and your customers will give you sort of incremental ideas on what they're missing in life. Um, and I solved those incremental needs. And I, I would do just about anything, uh, anything legal uh, when we were starting that company up. But I also realized that customers were very short-sighted. In this case, the customers were the military, State Department, some other folks. Uh, they had very incremental needs. And those needs were largely logistics. They wanted a rocket lab taken down, some chemical thing taken down. They needed forts built along the roads. They needed weapons and supplies brought into Fallujah. OK, those are all incremental needs. We made money on that. But what I realized about um, six months into being there was that their real need was that they could, we could fight conventionally all we wanted. But the war was not going to be fought, fought conventionally. It was the people. Uh, in the military, we didn't have to dominate a road or, or a city. We had to win the, you know, go back to Vietnam, the hearts and minds. We had to win the local people. This, you know, the civilian populace was the battlefield in Iraq. It is the battlefield going forward. Whether you realize no matter where we fight, um, I realized that we had to basically win uh, with civilian populations. And so some people said I opened up a public relations firm. Some people call it psychological warfare. Some people call it unconventional warfare. Whatever it is, I realized that there's a real need to combine human intelligence, technology, um, some, some proprietary analytical methodologies, and some real, uh, some real hardcore folks to get stuff done, and combine those four teams together and uh, create a solution that ended up making just an ass load of money. And I had no intention of going in and making money, actually. Um, I was just passionate about this thing and kind of did it. So, so I kind of glossed over probably five years of very interesting adventures there. <laughs> um, so how did this work? I went, went in Iraq. Uh, another key lesson is that my, my company started very small. My first contract was with DARPA. Defense, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And they had a team on the ground, and they needed a team in sort of the red zone. They need guys to, to go out and get stuff done for them. And I did. It was like five grand, right? And who's going to build a business on five grand? But my next contract, the Marine Corps needed an operation run down to Yusufia. It's this crazy little uh, triangle south of Baghdad where all the folks that really hate us kind of hold up and lived. And they need someone stupid enough uh, or smart enough or Someone who just had trucks to go down there and take care of some stuff. So they paid us 30 grand to go run an operation down there. And uh, took down this rocket lab in the middle of Baghdad for about $165,000. But what I learned along the way is that these little projects snowballed. Um, and I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, you aim too big. It's good to think big. But I'll tell you, there's a difference between strategy and tactics. So strategically, you're going to build a company, you're going to have a big vision. Because if you don't have a big vision, in my opinion, you're wasting your time. If you don't have a big vision to change the world, um, and it's fine. Some of you will maybe start you know, a yogurt franchise, and that's fun. But I'm really attracted to folks that have like a big vision to change the world. But a big vision is not one with big leaps. A big vision is one tactically executing day after day, small little things, the nuts and bolts, the details of your business. And, and I meet dreamers all the time, entrepreneurs who think big and want to execute big, but the reality is you don't execute big. You execute small, you think big. And, and I'm not sure you really find this out until you actually start to build a company. That uh, sitting down and, you know, the finances, the spreadsheets, the, the nuts and bolts of, you know, I was sitting down two days ago looking at our cell phone bills and called up AT&T and got them to, cancel all these crazy deposits they've been holding. Every time we got equipment, they'd take a 1000 bucks out of our account. Sounds stupid for a CEO, but it's just part of your, part of your responsibility. 
Sounds dumb. All those little details add up when you're building a company. And if you're going to be a good leader, you care about those details. Uh, Marine Corps, West Point definitely taught me to pay attention to details. Um, I think you find out in life um, that you can't run for those little details. Those little details will kick your ass. Right? And you're going to be thinking big. You're going to assume everyone else in your company is taking care of the little details, and you're wrong. So lesson here, think big, execute tactically. In Iraq, building this company up, $5,000 contract, $30,000 contract, $160,000 contract. How in the hell do I get to $20 million, $100 million contracts? All those people I served, all those lessons I learned, what we did along there, added up. You know, there were people bidding on insanely large contracts when we got there. I didn't waste my time on that. I went for the little things. Built a reputation. And I built a reputation of getting everything done. And your reputation is critical. And you'll find out, uh, especially as an entrepreneur, you know, I know that my network between here, Silicon Valley, Boulder, New York, Austin, your reputation is critical. And, and not that it's unimportant to you if you're not an entrepreneur, but keep in mind that when you're an entrepreneur, you're going to build a company out of nothing, right? You know, most likely, you will have almost no resources. So what you'll have are promises. You'll have vision. You'll have ideas for people. You'll have promises you're going to make to investors, but you won't have the money or people to actually deliver on that. And they're going to look at your reputation. And they're going to look at your history. So jealously guard that reputation as an entrepreneur. Not that you shouldn't, if you do other things, but as an entrepreneur, remember that you will be judged very strongly on your reputation. And you can fail. And you can fuck up as an entrepreneur, but you have to be honest about it. Um, I'll get to that. So... Did I make mistakes? I made a ton of mistakes. I got guys killed in Iraq. Um, and uh, we, you know, we did some things improperly. Uh, it's the nature of warfare, and it sucks. And as an entrepreneur, you're going to make mistakes. And you have to be honest with it. I mean, the worst thing is going to your customer or going to your people and telling them that you made a mistake. And it's, uh, it's a really, really difficult thing to do, is to admit failure. Um, but I, I've learned that you can definitely learn from that failure. In uh, Better Works today, you know, uh, I've encouraged many people to try things out and make mistakes. You want to pivot around failure. So you, know, you hear this stupid word pivot all the time, right? Um, so the difference is some folks like to think a lot and some folks like to do, and you have to have a balance. And there's this old Chinese proverb that, uh, uh, what is this, uh, daydreaming? Oh, all thinking uh, without action is... Uh, is a dream, and all action without thought is a nightmare. And the reality is that you have to find a balance between the two. So as an entrepreneur, you have to think big, and you have to execute. And I see entrepreneurs all the time who are thinking, thinking, thinking. I mean, James here is from GRP. I mean, you, you probably get founders that just, people pitch you, and they're thinking, and they got giant spreadsheets, and they have analysis, and they have market research, and they have product diagrams, and you're like, what have you actually done? And in many cases, nothing. You know, it's really easy to think. It's really easy to imagine the world in your head as it should be. Think about all that money you're going to make and all those people you're going to help and that beautiful thing you're going to do. And, uh, and you talk to some folks and they just haven't done anything. Right? I mean, they haven't gone out there and talked to a customer. They haven't actually sat down and just built some code. So do it. I mean, execution is such a simple thing when you think about it. But it's scary to people as entrepreneurs. Like a lot of us who, who want to be entrepreneurs, you don't like the idea of failing. I hate failing. I mean, I, I don't lose. Um, I've been competitive, I think, since birth. Um, and I don't know what it is. Some of us have that DNA where we just want to win. And it's not that ruthless winning, but it's like that I feel good when I win. I'm, I'm not ashamed of that. I like competing and winning. I like to be with a team of people who kick ass and are the best. I don't mind winning at all. I mean, sometimes I see our society, I don't know. Some people don't really like that idea. I love competition. So... Winning, though, is, uh, is hard because the reality is you're going to lose sometimes. Right? So as an entrepreneur, it's very easy to sit down there and be smart and have a great plan. But then when you go out to sell to a customer and they say, no, your idea is ridiculous and stupid, and VCs tell you 50 times, no, I'm not going to fund you. I've told entrepreneurs, I told Jody Sherman from Ecomom three times to screw off. I had no, no interest in selling shit to moms. His website... It's pretty amazing to sell stuff to moms, but I told them three times I had no interest 
in investing in his idea. And he was persistent. Followed up, followed up, and I finally gave him 15 minutes at a Starbucks in Beverly Hills over a year ago. Met this guy, and he convinced me face to face to invest in him. Um, and you have to be persistent in life. So um, let's get back to passion. That was uh, supposed to be a key thing I was going to talk about, and I kind of got off track. But uh, I wanted to give you a few different lessons I've learned through my experiences. So passion, how did I actually go from Baghdad to what I call the boardroom? And we actually, I guess we have a boardroom, right, Robin, somewhere? We have a conference room called a boardroom. But I've been in other boardrooms. But how did I get from Baghdad to the boardroom? How did I get from Baghdad, war zone, building a company, to tech and entrepreneurship and all this, this life that has nothing to do with war? Um, and it comes back to passion. So as an entrepreneur why, and, and investor, why do I look for passion in someone? The reason is all of you are going to hit a point where life sucks. Whether that means you just had 12 people killed in Baghdad and your $20 million contract is under, you know, under threat and you've got to go talk to folks about why their whole family died um, or you're at the end of your money. I, I was not born wealthy. Now, I grew up extremely poor. Um, and when I sunk that $80,000 in, that was everything. I took an equity line of credit out of my house. I went balls in, everything. If I had fucked up, I'd have no house, have no assets, I'd be broke. It was, uh, it was stressful. I was, probably more, I was definitely more stressed out about the financial side of it than being killed. I wasn't really worried about that part. But I was passionate about what I was doing there. Like, I really believed that I could go there and change the world. I believed that I could change how the Marine Corps and the Army would win these battles. We did. I mean, we did amazing things in the elections, tactically in, in both battles of Fallujah. We did some amazing stuff. But if I didn't have that passion, I would have given up. Entrepreneurs are irrational people. If you're a good entrepreneur, you are irrational. That means that you have found something you love so much that you will do anything, hopefully anything morally right, but you will do anything to win. And that's why I look for passion. You know, the normal person, the, you know, the person that goes into it with the spreadsheets and he can tell you exactly how big the market is and why it's going to make money and why this product is needed, that's great. But if you don't have the passion to suffer through those months when you can't make payroll and the months when people are leaving you and shit's falling apart and the press is attacking you and you're on the front page of the LA Times and the whole world is telling you that you're wrong, if you don't have the guts and the passion to go through that, then you are not an entrepreneur. And you should ask yourself that before you waste your time. If you're doing something you're not passionate about, don't believe that everything you do in life is going to be easy, because it won't. Yeah, I think every entrepreneur goes through at least one period in their company where it looks like things are going to fall apart. And if you actually don't love what you're doing, you're probably going to give up. And that's why I care about as an investor. Two reasons. One, I, I think you're going to be a lot more successful if you do what you love. And second, I, I just don't think you're going to actually see the company through if you don't love it. It's really dumb to think that you're not going to have a hard time. So I'll speed through a bunch of this Iraq stuff and Afghanistan stuff. It's actually not that interesting unless you guys love the world of you know, counterterrorism and asymmetric warfare. A lot of it doesn't have that much application to be an entrepreneur. But after that, 07, I uh, was able to get a management team in place to run the company. And I took a lot of time off. I took a year a little over a year, figuring out what did I want to do. I just spent the last five years of my life in war zones, building up an insane company, had this crazy cult of people that followed me around. We got great shit done. Um, I had to decide what I wanted to do next in life, and I didn't actually know. I, I see people make this mistake of just jumping into something. So, A, I need time to just de-stress. Five years of war zones is a long time. And so I just went around Caribbean, went around South America, had a good time, and started exploring things. I ended up in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, talking to VCs. Very quickly realized that me with a VC, not a good fit. Um, probably the whole rule-breaking thing. So I realized I would never fit inside a VC, but I got exposed to this world of angel investing. And sort of I found this next path in my career, something that I loved. You know, I loved the national security space. I still love it. I still have a real passion for solving our nation's um, security issues. But this angel investing thing kind of hit me, and I dwelled on it. But 
Do you all know what an angel investor is? Maybe you don't, but angel investors are just, it's a really simple name for a guy or girl that takes their own personal money and invests in companies. And this was my passion. I found, I was like, these people are really fascinating. They don't follow any rules. You meet people, you, you meet entrepreneurs, you talk to them, you sit down with them, you help them out, and you invest in them. That was like, wow, this is a really cool job. Why didn't someone show this to me before? And I realized, yeah, actually, I have to have money to do this job. But, <laughs> but this is really cool. You get to work with, like, I mean, I've talked to thousands of entrepreneurs around the country. So that's why when I talk to you, it's not just my experience. I've met and talked and worked with thousands of entrepreneurs. I've only invested in a little over 40 of them. Some are dual founders. There's about 80 founders across that space. But entrepreneurship is just like, I'm addicted to that stuff. Um, I love it. I can't, put a, I can't really put my finger on why I love entrepreneurship. And I love creation. I love solving problems. I love working with bright, brilliant, passionate people to get stuff done. So I found this amazing space called angel investing. And I spent uh, 08 through 010 investing. Now let's call, go through this journey. So it's like Sacramento, going to be an artist, going to be a diplomat, go to West Point, travel around, kind of be a bum, enlist in the Marine Corps, go into the human intelligence community, start a private defense company, run around the world for five years, take a year off, and I'm an angel investor. Does that journey make any sense to any of you? I mean, no, no clue, right? I, there's no one that would ever predict, ever predict what I did in life. And I've been trying to think about what that journey means and how you get there. The reality is I can't tell you there's any path or any plan to make it to where I am. And I doubt that most of you want to be here because you all should have your own thing you want to do in life. The only thing I can tell you is along the way, I had a good sense to follow my heart, which goes back to passion. And I realized through all those steps in the journey, when I did something that was wrong, I wasn't afraid to give up what I had put into it. I wasn't afraid to give up Sac State in three years of Mandarin Chinese, which is a bitch. I mean, I can't believe I studied Mandarin Chinese. I'd never do it again. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> West Point was somewhat useful, but if you've ever done the pain I mean, of West Point, I have no idea what childbirth is, but West Point is like three years of just constant childbirth out of your face. It's just like, it's insane. <laughs> and I had no problem, I had no problem giving that up. Absolutely none. You know, I checked in with my dad, but I was like, my, my mind was made up. So I always looked at those as some costs. I was never afraid to change and do what I loved. And I think that's going to be a challenge all of you will face. Maybe some of you face it now, which is, I can't tell you what that journey is, but when you recognize that you're not doing what you love in life, Keep in mind that this is a very, very brief time that you have here. And what is it you're actually going to do with it? And do you really want to do spreadsheets for some dude? Any of you guys do spreadsheets here? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So whatever you're doing, like, realize when it's time to give that up and do something new. And this is all about self-control, self-determination, entrepreneurship, is the biggest ego game in the world. It's about you. It's about what you want to do. And it's about doing the thing you believe in, not the thing that other people are telling you to do. So I, I can't explain that journey. There's no way predicting Sacramento, Baghdad, angel investor, CEO. It's just always following my heart. So today I'm sitting here. I'm the CEO of BetterWorks, co-founder uh, with two amazing guys. And we're almost a 30-person team now. Robin Ward is here, Mike McGlade. Maybe here if he's not late. You here, Mike? Okay, great. <laughs> so, how did I end up going from angel investor to being a CEO, co founder of this company? Well, that was a bit of uh, passion and a bit of just acting on gut instinct, but I met this guy, Zhao Yang, and this other equally amazing dude, George Ishii. Uh, Zhao went to UCLA briefly, gave it up, and uh, created a company called My Mini Life. My Mini Life created a technology called Farmville, which probably some of you suffered through. Uh, and Zell appreciates that. But uh, so I met this guy up partying in San Francisco, about eight tequilas in the night. And I meet this dude who's just like dancing crazy on the floor. I mean, Robin knows exactly what I'm talking about. When you meet Zell, you have no idea. But this guy is just like, uh, he's like a circus animal when he gets a few tequilas into him. <laughs> And so he, he's thrashing on the dance floor, amazing guy. And I just loved his energy, and we start talking. And you know how tequila talks go. 
But I was just like, there's something about this dude that I really liked. I had that gut instinct. And we decided to meet up, and we're doing a little angel investing together, and we realized that we had this commonality between us. We had a lot of similar perspectives on what we wanted to do in life, what we liked. And, uh, and so I sort of had this in my head, met this amazing guy. In the back of my mind, I'm always an entrepreneur. Whether I'm an angel investor, I'm going into Baghdad, it's all entrepreneurial for me. And I, I've been sitting there for like a year thinking, maybe it's time to build something again. And then I started talking to this dude, George Ishii. George I met through uh, some guys at Gum Gum. George was looking for some career advice. He's like, what's, you know, what's a cool company to go work for? George was an early Adobe engineer, realized he hated engineering, gave it up to become a product designer, joined PayPal very early, built the consumer-facing side of PayPal, uh, went through six years there, uh, went with David Sachs to co-found Yammer and Genie. Um, meet this guy, and he's like, killer personality, killer drive, killer passion for product and UX. You know, and I'm not much of a designer, but... I love to meet people who are just passionate about it, right? So I meet Zell. This guy is passionate about technology. The biggest mind you will ever meet. And, and, and great heart. And George Ishii, this guy who just loves design. Like, you look at the shit he makes. It's beautiful. It's clean. Um, I swear to God, he should be working at Apple. But meet him, and he's got a good heart, too. So I meet these guys that have equal passions in their own space. And I realize, like, it's time to do something. There's no plan there, uh, except that I've been angel investing for a couple of years. And I met these two equally amazing guys who had passion for what they do in life. And we sat down, and it took us, it took us just a couple weeks to decide to give up what we're doing. Zhao had sold his company to Zynga, was running Corp Dev and Mobile there. Doing, if you guys know Zynga, he, he had a sweet setup. Got a lot of cash and equity there, but he gave up Zynga. Uh, George came and joined us. And it took us maybe two weeks to make a dramatic shift in our lives. And uh, my life at the time was mainly, was mainly climbing and surfing and diving in Australia and taking my nephew to South America and having fun. And uh, so we all made these dramatic shifts in our life to found this company, BetterWorks. And it was just passion again. Met a couple passionate people. I found the space I love. We're, we're focused. I'm not going to use this platform to pitch our company. But uh, one of my passions is people. And so we built this platform focused on recognizing and rewarding talent in the workforce. And uh, I just found something that was passionate for me again. I had met two really passionate people. And then we had to build a team. And this is a hard thing. I mean, as an entrepreneur, once you decide you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to build a company, you know what you're going to do? You know the next really tough step, step for you is picking those people who are going to build that company with you. And this is where you're probably going to screw up a lot. If you get everything else right, you're going to screw this one up. And, and I screwed it up, too. And there's just a general rule about you know, hiring slow and firing very fast. And, uh, and I can't give you a recipe for this, but I'll tell you a few things that I look for when I'm an entrepreneur and the folks I hire. Uh, we got Ron here. Found Ron Yang. He's a UCLA guy. Uh, sold his company. Um, if you look at all the people that have joined Robin right here, we found people who just... You can't really put your finger on it, but they're amazing in their own right. They have great hearts. They have a passion for what they do. They bust their ass. Um, and I'm not sure what, um, what magical formula I can give you um, to recruit amazing people to join your team. It is a really hard thing to do. Is anyone here? So I'm sure some of you have tried to hire and are building teams right now. But making that decision of who's going to be with you on that journey... That's one part we haven't talked about, right? Because you don't go through that journey alone. This entrepreneurship journey, none of you are going to succeed on your own. So entrepreneurship is not a solo activity. And, and there's this big debate in the whole investing world whether single founder, co-founders, what's the best mix? You'll hear wide things. I really think it's a, a team sport, initially with that core team. It's usually two people, so in our case three. Being an entrepreneur is hard. Again, all the other stuff I told you about, just emotionally, mentally, time-wise, you're going to have a bad day, they're going to have a bad day. And I'm used to a fire team, a really small fire team going into a space, and I realized I love that small team concept. And that's one thing I love about entrepreneurship is working with really smart, fast, dynamic people who kick in doors and get shit done. And those are the kind of people I recruited for this. And for me, my mindset is I always look for, like, when I recruit someone, would I take them into battle with me? 
I know that's a framework you guys can't have for yourselves, but I think about sort of this mental template of the people that have worked best for me in the past, and I always think, would I take this person into war? And that's what works for me personally. But this journey is a team sport. It is not solo. And you will have to find and attract amazing people to join you. So this is probably something they don't teach you in school. Maybe they do. But you're going to be judged a lot, especially by VCs and others, about the team you build. I'll tell you, the team I've built is awesome, not because of me. People are impressed by Bedworks because of the other people who are there. I'm not that impressive. You meet George and Zhao and Robin and Ron and Mike and all these people, they are impressive. And you as an entrepreneur will be judged by that team you build. And this is probably the hardest thing you're going to do. You probably, some of you have great product ideas, you've got great ideas for the market, what are you going to do? But I guarantee you that a lot of you probably have no clue how you're going to build that team. Right? Probably sure a lot of you sit up at night thinking, who in the hell would join my stupid idea? Maybe not. Maybe you're, you're emboldened by it. But I'll, tell, I'll give you some tips on how to attract people. One, make sure you have that vision. Don't waste people's time. Don't get people to quit their jobs, quit school, move across from New Mexico or Omaha and join your idea unless you have a big vision. Why in the hell am I going to walk down a really short, dark alley with you when someone else has this you know, 500-meter runway that we're going to take off and change the world? What is this vision that's worth sacrificing for. You gotta learn how to communicate that thing. A lot of you are thinking numbers and things like, what is it about this world that you are gonna change? And I'll tell you, that will attract good people if that vision means something. A lot of you think I'm gonna make, you know, uh, it's a fine, I know someone here is making like vegan waffle mix, right, whenever you're here, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to go attract probably a large team to do that. But if you're going to build a company, if you're going to build the next Twitter, Facebook, Quora, Airbnb, something like that, you better have a big vision. Otherwise, you're going to attract idiots. If you don't have a big vision, you're going to attract idiots. You have to learn how to communicate this vision. Um, it might be in your head, practice, uh, talk to folks, but if you want to attract great people, you have to give them a vision that actually makes sense. The second thing we've done deliberately is that we, we pay shitty salaries, right, Robin? <laughs> yes. The early days of a startup are not about making money. Um, sit down with your people and find out what they need to survive. But my theory of building a company is not to hire coin-operated people. I didn't hire them in Iraq. I didn't hire them in Afghanistan. We didn't hire them now. People that want to make salaries should work for corporate America don't come work for me or any other entrepreneur. People that just want to pay their bills, potentially dig in their pocketbooks a little bit and suffer, can come work for us. And you have to suffer. Entrepreneurship is not fantasy land. Entrepreneurship is a very painful crucible. And part of that is suffering. Do I have to get off the stage soon? Is like a... What? A couple minutes. Okay, cool. Do you guys want to do any Q&A or just let me just talk nonstop? Okay, I'll shut up real soon. Um, okay, so I wanted to point this out because this team part is important. So have a big vision. Don't pay people to join you. Okay? We have, shit, 10. I think we got 10 people basically working for free for us. Uh, on a performance basis, but no salary. They only get to eat what they kill. <laughs> They're amazing sales. I mean, really crazy ton of USC kids. I think a couple of UCLA folks made it in, but USC really kicked ass on this last four weeks of hiring. Um, but we brought a lot of people in who are willing to come work with us, and they only get to eat what they kill. They're all working on sales. But don't be deluded. There's no one in our company who makes a great salary. I hate it when I meet an entrepreneur who like, has their uh, use of proceeds, and it's like, I'm going to pay myself 100 grand. Which one of you fuckers needs 100 grand salary? I hate that shit. I re really, like when I see that, I'm like, I will not fund this person. Unless you got 18 kids and two baby mamas sitting <laughs> somewhere. And you shouldn't be starting a company with that kind of baggage anyways. But you've got to be lean and mean. And you have to attract people who work for you because of the vision, because they believe in it. You're trying to attract people who have the same passion you do. 
So I hope some piece of what I said may or may not be useful to some of you. I'll open up for questions and answers now. Maybe you can't. Yeah, maybe you can't. I mean, in my case, till now, maybe. What? I mean, up till now. Uh, Did you find someone? No, not yet. So you haven't? Today. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure there's some people in this room, but so how do you find them? So I didn't really get through some of the tactics. Put yourself out there. Go to the watering holes where people, um, you know, entrepreneurial people are at. Go to every one of those. They'll suck. So... But just remember, most of them have alcohol, so you can work your way through some of those painful moments. <laughs> but go, I mean, here's the thing. Go to those places. Don't try to recruit on Craigslist. Don't do all that shit. Go to the places where entrepreneurial people hang out and meet them and suffer. I mean, I tell you, I met George and Zhao because I went to everything. I went to so many painfully retarded entrepreneurial get-togethers. Um, but it only takes one right Like when I go to events, I'm not looking to meet everyone in a room. I'm happy when I meet just one amazing person. I've never gone for the volume approach of like, let's meet everyone. Meet one person there and then deliberately spend your time with just one or two people at that event. That's a lot better use of your time. Next. Shoot. First, uh, I'd just like to give a shout out to Sacramento. Thank you. Sacramento as well. Good. You know Oak Park? Uh, Citrus Heights. Citrus Heights, okay. Yeah, do one. One project is a, like a, a tool from my old company to solve some of their problems that you're talking about. Okay. And I'm trying to make a deal with them to help fund what I'm doing. And I'm wondering, like I'm approaching this from the standpoint I trust them a lot. So I'm wondering, uh, if you were me, like would you try to build the system out a lot before presenting to them? Or would you, what type of assurances do you think I should be looking for in this situation? Because I don't want to, they have a reputation. Is your question only around the NDA? Uh, yeah, how, how, how yeah, I don't give a shit about NDA. <laughs> yeah, so this whole, entrepreneurs, this whole, like, you're going to come to me, make me sign NDA as an angel investor, there's no way. Yeah. Um, we make employees sign on competes and NDAs and you know, <coughs> IP assignment stuff that you have to do when you're building a tech company. But you're at the stage, don't worry about that shit. Okay. Really. Yeah. A theme. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a couple of moleskins. So and this is one other thing. I do. I, I'm filled with ideas all the time. So I document everything in a moleskin. Like when I travel, I don't do the whole laptop. I do paper, pen, and a moleskin. And I have a I have a book of companies. If any of you want to build some of them, I just pick the best one. Uh, but how do I pick them? You know, I'll give you some advice from. I find things I love in life and things I think will make things better. Um, as an investor, I had a, a theme, I had a matrix. I looked at three verticals that I really enjoyed, and I looked at two horizontal themes that I thought society was going towards. Uh, the verticals were entertainment, uh, social data, and small business software. Those were just themes of things I liked. And then the horizontals, and if you look, think about this as a matrix, <laughs> were trends in society that I wanted to invest alongside. Betting is something that I thought would increase over time. So those two horizontals were transparency and mobility. And not mobility from the idea of like a phone, but the idea that people generally want to be mobile and that we're in a society now where we're disconnecting from the desktop and all these little mobile devices will let us be more mobile. So I, uh, how did I get there? I sat down and thought about it a lot. Did a lot of, uh, a lot of travel. Um, every time I work out, I try to put an idea in my head and use that uh, throughout the run or climb. And just think about it. And uh, think about a billion things. I don't know. Lots of thinking. 
That's um plaid shirt? Last one, last one. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs that are going for what? What advice do you have for entrepreneurs that are looking for an angel investment round versus just got a seed round now looking to continue moving forward? What advice do you have? You have a seed round? You have a seed round. You're looking for an angel round? So you're just looking for more money? What advice do you have for us? I don't know. I mean, that's a pretty open question. Do it. <laughs> What's your specific? Oh, how to do it? Talk to a lot. Of, I mean, so you're very lucky right now. You sit in an era where all the information you need to raise money is being thrown at you. Like the internet is just vomiting information for you to find out where to get funded. So angel list, the funded... You know, Mike Suster's blog, like, this is free shit for you. This is easy nowadays. You can research every VC, every angel investor, look on Facebook, look on LinkedIn, do your homework, go to people that invest in the space that you're doing, get to know them, and then be persistent. Be polite, but persistent. I tell you, Jody Sherman would have never got funding from me if he hadn't hit me up all the time, hadn't used my social network to get to me, but he did it politely. And when an investor really says, like, no, don't waste my time. You can try it, but be careful in there. But I'd say persistence and do a shitload of research. It's so easy these days. Cool. And that's last, right? Yeah, let's do that. Sweet. Let's uh, give everybody give a page a hand here. Thanks, buddy. Thank you very much. That's really good, man. Thanks, buddy. That's really good. Good time. Yeah. Good